Okay, hello everybody. I'm here live with Paul Essien, uh, one of our speakers at Grow Your Potential. And um, we're just going to ask a few questions. Paul, thank you very much for joining me today. I know you're very busy. I know you've got a busy okay. schedule. But um, yeah, we appreciate you spending your time. Just wanted to find out a bit more about the man. Um, obviously, we have attendees come and they hear about you, uh, your journey. Um, yes. And sometimes people have a chance to ask questions during the question and answer session. So we thought we've got some questions from some of the attendees that didn't get to ask those questions on the day. But I just wanted to find a bit more about yourself. So my first question is, just tell us a little bit about how you got into business. What is, where did your story begin? Um, I think my story in terms of my, how I first got into business, I think it came from watching my mother, to be honest. Okay. Um, she found a way to create commerce out of every opportunity and also every problem. Whether it was selling dresses that she made or altering people's dresses, wedding dresses, church dresses. Um, so that's when I realised what I guess a side hustle was. Right. You know, in the nineteen eighties, the fact that she had two or three jobs. Right. But she was making money at home on a sewing machine. Um, so yeah, I think that's where I first learned about business. And okay. About the basic ability to get something whether it's a product or a service, add value and sell that product for money. Okay. Um, fast forward to myself as an adult and I graduated from university in 2004 um, and I've, I've been self-employed since I'd say my first year of university. I, ha I haven't been in somebody else's employment since the year 2000 so that's you know most of my adult life. Right. I've, I've been in business one okay. way or another, so yeah. Okay. Um, from selling um, salvage cars that we purchase and repair and sell back to car showrooms. It's probably the first real large scale commerce that I've been. Interesting. It's funny, on a side note, a neighbour of mine, I think, is doing that. Uh, there's just cars everywhere on his driveway. I think he's, he's got a new one now. There was an Audi parked outside my house. Now it's been replaced with a BMW. He's got another Mercedes at the side. He's got another Mercedes on his driveway. And then he's got his little white van that he does painting and decorating. And that's his day job, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, would you, could you please share what you feel is your biggest mistake that you made maybe early on in business? What, what was the biggest mistake that you feel you made? Biggest mistake, um, I could give you 10 really? biggest mistakes. I really could. Um, biggest mistake, the biggest mistake, people, you know, people looking at my story who have been close to it will be tempted to say taking too many risks financially, they'll be taking, tempted to say doing too many hours, they'll be tempted to say, you know, not um, paying attention to the detail. But the truth is, the biggest mistake I made was not protecting my business in the right way. Okay. Um, so we all know now that there are dangers and risks when you expose your baby, your business to the world. Mm -hmm. People often say, well, I've got an idea, I need funding or I need this and that, but I'm worried that if I share it with people, they will see it. Right. The truth is some people will, if you allow them to, if you do not protect your business properly. I did not protect my business properly. Um, too much exposure and access was given to people, some things were not critical right. to their function. And also sometimes we have to be honest about our egos and we have to have self-awareness. If you come up with something really fantastic, you won't be able to know how fantastic <laughs> <right>. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't need to see every part of it. Right. They don't need to see the intricacies of, of how the mechanisms work because that gives them access to your baby. Okay. They just need to know that it works. Right. And so the biggest mistake I made was that I gave too much exposure to the wrong people. And how do you know who the wrong people are? Everybody is the wrong person. Right. Right. Um, so that's the biggest mistake. 
you know, if we had longer, I could give you nine other chapters on business. Okay. I'd okay. say, if I was to pick one, it would be that. Okay, that's good. So, I guess if you... Uh, uh, maybe you've answered this, but in a sense of giving advice to people who they've got an idea um, mm -hmm. and having that balance of not um, keeping it so secret that nobody knows and nobody can help, uh, but also not exposing it too much. What advice would you give to someone in that position? The advice would give to somebody in that position, and I think it's important to clarify that position. When I speak to people about stars and businesses, when I speak to people about that position, I mean you are broke, you have no money. You need investment, you need import, you can't afford patents, you cannot afford draconian contracts. I'm assuming you are broke. The best way to protect your idea is to make sure you have complete or as complete as possible product knowledge. Right. With what I know now about my business, I could tell everybody every single part of my business. Mm and they would not be able to compete with us. That's not ego, that's the price we paid for our product knowledge. Right. So we've erected barriers around our business and around our capabilities to what we know. Right. Now, I can learn more for free. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm broke, I can have as close to complete product knowledge as possible as long as I'm willing to pay for it with a currency that isn't money, my currency is money, right. my currency is commitment, my currency is a willingness to do what other people want, mm. my currency is an endurance, all of these things are free. Mm. And that is the best way to protect your business because once you know your product, once you know the industry that your product is, is really, that your product is, is, um, is invested in, that your product is related to, once you know the industry inside out, there are natural ways to protect your product. Mm -hmm. There are natural ways to get compliance. There are natural ways to erect barriers around your product and around your ability to monetize your product. Okay. So product knowledge, that's the best way. If you're broke, that's the best way if you make money. Product knowledge. Okay. That's excellent advice. I'm sure that's, that's valuable even to me. Um, I'm sure it's valuable to a lot of people watching. Um, my next question is slightly different. I wanted to ask... And I'm sure many people like to know, how do you transition from being the only person in charge, uh, doing everything? You are the account manager, you are the um, uh, promoter, you're the marketer, you, you, you do everything. How do you transition from being in that position and maybe not necessarily being afford to pay anybody else to help out to actually you know to a position like yourself where you're you're hiring staff and you're actually going through recruitment phase you're hiring multiple members of staff uh, uh, during this time how do you transition from being by yourself to actually having staff that you pay and that is an actual business um i think you start before your business and sounds um, like a, a trick answer to the normal <laughs> question, it's not. Um, in our business, our business is based on our identity. Every time I've spoken, even down to when I was talking about cars, I speak of we. I use we a lot because <laughs> for me, I have an us, I have a we. I have the we of my family. We have certain principles and we have an identity. I may see my brother twice a year, but when we speak on the phone, it's the same. If we were in a situation after not seeing each other for six months, and we're in a room and a decision has to be made, I know exactly what he's going to do. Okay. I have that same dynamic with my business partner. Um, you will have an us even if you don't have a business. You will have an identity even if it's in yourself, if it's in your group of friends, if it's in your family, you will have an us. Now that us forms your identity, it forms how you problem solve, it forms how you go forward. When you are starting a business, it's not always a good idea to start businesses with your best friends. Unless they've got skills that you don't have. Right. Unless they've got things that they can do that you can't do, or they've got things that they can bring to bear on a situation that are of value, then they are your us, they're your tribe, they're your truth. Now, to get so just to now go directly back to your question is that how do you make that transition? You make that transition by establishing exactly what you do, exactly what processes are core to your business, and what skills are required for those 
for those processes, what skills are required for each phase of your business, and then you find your skills. Mm -hmm. Again, assuming you don't have the money for recruitment, right? you find those skills in your network, you find those skills in your phone book, you find those skills in your us, in your tribe, in your troop, and you plug them in. And that frees you up not to sit down while other people do the legwork. No, that's not business, that's not leadership. What that enables you to do is, enables you to concentrate on things that you are strong at. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not strong at some of the processes, some of the systems, some of the structure in our business. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I have not had to deal with some of the things that I'm terrible at in our business mm -hmm. for more than two years because my business partner deals with them with a plan. Mm -hmm. Now, that again goes back to who you are initially, it goes back to what your network is and you can plug and play from there. So for me, the initial answer again, I'm being very realistic, I'm not assuming you have money for a recruitment plan. You look at your network, you look at the skills that you have available to you, the skills that you can plug into your business, and you start there. That's how you start making a transition to where you are not doing every part of the business. Whereas other people playing a role, you know what they can do, you know what their strengths are, more importantly, you know what their weaknesses are, and you tailor the day-to-day -day accordingly. Okay, I think that answers the question as far as um, I guess initial structure is concerned. I think you're right, it's very important. I think if you don't know yourself, what you want to do, how you see the expansion, you won't know the type of people that you need. So I think that's definitely good advice. In terms of money, because money talks, you know, if you're going to ask somebody in your network, as you've advised, to help out with something that you're not strong at, um, how do you negotiate that? Do you offer them money? Do you tell them that you will share certain of the profits? How did you go about that initially and what would you advise to others? Um, I think it comes down to what you're willing to do for your business. Um, people will take note as to the sacrifices you're willing to pay for your business. Um, people say, oh, they don't have any money, but they've got a great idea. Well, like, I don't buy that, you know? Get a job in a bar, get a sales job, and work in your business at night, and then put the money from your sales job into your business before you turn around and ask people for money. People read the headlines of all these self-help books and all these business guides about use other people's money to make money. When you're starting from the door, you can't do that. You have no track record. You have no books to show people as to why they will give you money. So the money comes from yourself initially. Then when you're negotiating for further support, when you're, whether it's for people, whether it's for funding, the options you have are equity really, a stake in the business. But if your business isn't already performing or doing something or at least showing glimpses of what you can do, how do you say, well, 30% of my business is worth this or is worth you giving me 50 grand? Um, I think it really is important how you start up and it really is important what price you are willing to pay to support your business because people will look at that and mm -hmm. say, well, hold on, if you're not willing to put in your money to it, mm -hmm. why should I put my money? Right. You know, and, that, and that's, it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal. And, you know, sometimes maybe you don't have money, but you're willing to pay a sweat off it. You don't have the money to do it, but they see you working like a dog mm -hmm. every single day for the business. That's your offering. That is your price. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where you start. Anything beyond that is too complicated. Okay. Drafting contracts based on what? And attracting investment based on what? What, what do you have to show for? Mm -hmm. well, Sam, if you can't justify the value of your business without a spreadsheet mm -hmm. and without people being able to look at what you are doing, and seeing the potential, or at least the way in which you are doing it, then you will probably want that. Okay. Um, in terms of your business, I know you haven't really spoken about your business now. Um, you're, I guess on the face of it, a property business. You're buy and sell contracts and property, etc. Uh, but I know there's a lot more to it. Um, tell us a bit about how you started off employing people in your business and how you allow people to actually get paid, especially from those times when maybe there wasn't a profit there that you have now. So, when our, our business, it was immediately apparent that one person couldn't do it. 
Mm. I mean, one person could do work, but one person couldn't do the work. Right. Um, there are a hundred repossessions a day. Our business works with people that are facing repossession. So um, it's important in our business that we make contacts with the homeowners before they lose their home. Right. Um, we send, we've always sent out a lot more immediately. Um, we immediately realised that we have to write to more than 100 people a day um, and visit as many people as we could because a lot of people don't often know. So in itself, currently we probably do 40 hours of driving a day as a company. Um, one person can't do that, so mm. immediately we need to take on staff. At the time I couldn't afford to pay a Betsy because our income was sporadic. Okay. The way in which we had contracts with our local partners or with our buyers wasn't the way it is now. We would um, be remunerated from the buyer once the buyer had sold the property. Right. So, you know, that can take months and mm. take years. So there wasn't a constant cash flow. So we then changed that to an agency fee where we charge an agency fee to the seller and we give a commission from the agency fee to our staff, but initially that wasn't the case. Right. It was, we would give a percentage of what we'd receive from the buyer in three months or four months or five months to our number of staff, either right. 10% or 33%. Whoa. <laughs> but it was But, you know, this is what it is. If you don't have the money to pay a basic, you have to pay higher interest. Mm. It's like a savings account. If you've got um, a current account where you've got access to that money straight away, you get a low interest mm. um, rate. If you put your money in a five-year um, account where you can't touch that money for five years, you get higher interest. They pay you a higher percentage mm. because you're ultimately waiting for them to make money off your money before they give you your interest. Because mm. what you're doing if you don't, if you can't pay some of your salary, right. you're saying, I'm making money off your time, mm. when I make the money off your time, I will pay you, which means you have to pay more money. Right. Um, it's still workable, but I just want to advise people to pay as much as I pay, because what you're doing is then, you're not valuing your business, you're not valuing your system. Mm. Mm. Because, fair enough, these people are putting in work, but um, they can only do the work if your system is in place. Right. Therefore, you know, a token needs to be shown to, to the system that you have. Of course, yeah. Because without that system, they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. Yeah, of course. So, 33%, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, if you can't afford to pay people a salary, you have to come up with something, maybe equity, maybe a percentage, or maybe higher commissions, but just make sure in your commission structure you are correctly valuing your system. Okay. That's excellent. Thanks very much for that. Um, what is your idea of success? Um, it's nothing um, too philosophical, you know, success is a journey and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's fine. My idea of success is more personal to what my targets and goals are. Okay. So before I started my business, I listed my targets and goals. Goals. I read a book called The Four Hour Work Week, and you know, the first chapter is just about well, what exactly do you want? Mm -hmm. And it could be the most materialistic thing you could want an Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. Now, that Aston Martin may cost £135,000, but you could probably lease it for £2,000 a month. Now, you may want a house in Hampstead, that house in Hampstead may cost a million pounds. That means the mortgage is about £4,000 a month. Okay, you may want to go on holiday four times a year. Altogether, that may be £15,000 a year, but that's about £1,200 a month. So if that's what you want, you need to be earning £7,000 a month to get the lifestyle that you want. Mm. Now, that changed a lot for me because, well, well, you know, then that's not 10 years away. That's not five years away. Mm. If you're saying you need to make £7,000 a month, to get the lifestyle that you want, and that's actually what's getting you up in the morning, and you've got a product that you sell for £700, and it costs you £200, your profit's £500, well then, 
you know that if you can sell 15, 16 units per month, you can immediately get the lifestyle that you want. Mm. So that's what success looks like. Right. Success looks like selling 15 units of your good or your service per month. Right. So again, your success depends on what the targets are going for. Some people's success is having health, having a healthy family that can all swim or that go to good schools or mm. that, um, you know, all can speak languages. Success may be, you know, to see your parents back home. Success may be your mother not working with you. So my success was personal to what I wanted. I listed my targets and goals. I listed what my targets and goals would cost me. Then I listed how I thought I could achieve my targets and goals. What get how I could get there step by step to each target or goal. For instance, one target was um, learn being fluent in German and Arabic by October 2019. So then I found well at the time I could not afford a tutor, so were there any apps that I could download, were there any books that I could read, etc, etc. And then you work away at that every day for half an hour a day or an hour a day until you can speak German and Arabic. So depending on where you are in your journey, you know, I can tell you where I am on my journey in terms of you know, speak German and Arabic and I'm, there's no success at that point. Ah. <laughs> So, it just depends on what the targets and goals are. That, okay. to me, determines success. Um, you know, but the, the tick box stuff that most other people say, a healthy family, um, being able to say that I'm better today than I am yesterday, you know, all the cliche stuff, I'd say that as well. Hmm. But most importantly, it's dependent on whatever your, your goals are. Okay. So, I guess, uh, in a sentence, it's uh, meeting the targets that you set for yourself. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, a couple of fun questions, or should I say slightly different questions, just to get to know you a bit more. What gets you up in the morning? Um, my alarm. <laughs> but, but the reasons I've set my alarm is yeah. probably what gets me up. So again, back to my targets and goals. Okay. Um, certain things that I feel I need to do every day or most days to get what I want. Mm -hmm. at the when I, in the evenings, I don't have peace sometimes because I don't have the things that I want yet. Mm. So that dictates what time I go to sleep at night, or, right. for instance, or or what I listen to in the car mm -hmm. in the daytime. And then the knock-on effect is when my alarm goes off at 4.59, I can get up because I'm still tired, it's still dark outside, but, you know, on the days where I'm up and I'm not pressing snooze, it's because it's been in my mind from the last night, look, there's things we need to do to get what we want. So that's what gets me up in the morning. Okay, excellent. Um, one last question. Okay, what's your favourite song? Um, I can probably give you a top ten. A top ten. I, I, I'll, I'll allow, because it's you, I'll allow you to narrow it down to three. Okay. Um, I used to love her by Common. It's really okay. the common sense. Okay. Uh, um, gosh, this is hard. Yes, it is hard. You have to commit. You have to commit and discard all the rest of them. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have to think about eras now. This is some serious, serious yeah. stuff. We're showing our age. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you have a think about it and you come back to me and I'll post it in the comment underneath at the bottom of the video. Okay. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, just uh, finally, one last word of wisdom for anybody watching this video, somebody who um, has maybe heard of the Grow Your Potential event, uh, maybe they're not even able to get to the next event. One piece of advice that you can leave for them just so that they can, I guess, be energized. What is one pearl of wisdom that you would give to them to help them grow their own potential and get started? The find discipline to learn. It's, it's the most important thing you can do. Now, there's so many opportunities to learn and it comes down to a choice of whether you want to be educated or entertained. If you take the tube to school, to college, to work, you've got an hour there and an hour back probably if you live in a major city to educate yourself. There's, you know what every MC has to say. You've heard the song a hundred times. Don't need to listen to it again on your way to work. 
get an Audible account, download audio books, and learn about yourself, learn about your emotional intelligence, learn about your products, learn about your, your industry, listen to podcasts. But all of this stuff is free. There are so many free resources that you can tap into. And this is what you should be dealing with your time. I advise everybody to listen to, listen or read, because I, I struggle with hard copy books because I've never had the time to sit down with a book in my hand. Or maybe that's not true, but when I do have that time, I'd rather do something other than hold the book in my hand. But I spend a lot of time in, in transit. So I listen to non-fiction during the day and fiction during the evening. You know, that's not entirely accurate over the last 10 days because I, I've got a new fiction book that has been amazing and I finished it today, but I've been listening to that in the daytime. But other than that, I listen to non-fiction during the day and before I go to sleep, I listen to fiction because it stimulates my creativity. I find myself waking up with ideas, solving problems, even when I'm not thinking about the problem, just because my brain has been stimulated by the fiction and in the daytime, my brain's been able to um, use the, the non-fiction, the education, as also as a source of information. The most important thing I'd say to everyone is, is learn. You can learn for free every day. Attendance at the Grow Your Potential Seminar is a great way to learn. If you are not able to attend, read, listen. That's the best advice I can give you because that changed my life. I listened to four or five audio books and, and they changed my life in 2014. That's the truth. So that's what I did. Excellent, thank you. And also for those people watching, there will be an opportunity very soon to be able to subscribe to the Edgeware Education um, channel, sorry, to the website, uh, which will give you access to a similar type of conversation I'm having now with Mr. Paul Essien himself. Paul, thank you again so much for spending your time out of your busy schedule to share. Your pearls of wisdom is much appreciated. And I'm looking forward to hosting you again our next event on uh, the 17th, Saturday the 17th of November from 9 a.m. to, sorry, from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. All right, Paul, thank you very much. Um, take care and we'll speak soon. Thank you.